What's going on, Tyron? How you doing? <laughs> you know, I'm 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 excited. I'm excited, and I really appreciate um, you joining today. Um, you know, and I can't wait for people to hear your story because I think it's so powerful, especially and very relevant to what's happening now. So thank you again for for joining us. Man, I'm glad to be on. Man, I'm glad to be on for sure. Um, for those that are, have just joined right now, my name is Dahani Jones. Um, and, you know, there's real power, I, I believe, um, in, in people helping others. Um, and Stand Together and I have joined forces to really bring amazing people that are, are offering you inspiration, encouragement, and so many other levels of motivation, especially during this, this, uh, this troubling time. And there's a lot of things that are happening in this world right now. Um, but I'm here right now with Tyron Woodley. You know, he's a welterweight champion, UFC. Uh, he's, a, he's a powerhouse, right? Um, entertainment, renaissance man. Um, he's clearly def defied the odds. I, I know there's one thing that you love talking about, the fact that you're a husband, you're, you're a father, you have kids, um, and, uh, and you've diversified yourself in, in so many different ways. So hopefully everybody that's watching right now will be inspired by you know, so many things that you've been able to do. And I just want to say thank you again. And for everybody joining as well, you know, we've been doing the show for a long period of time and in support of hashtag Give Together Now. And we've been able to support a lot of people. Um, hashtag Give Together Now was really a relief effort to really get immediate cash assistance uh, directly to the hands of those that have been financially affected due to COVID-19. But we've affected the lives of over 122,000, 182 um, people that will all receive Five hundred dollars. It's it's been an amazing, um, and I know that we've been doing our show for a long time and we've had huge conversations. But there's a lot of things that are happening around racial injustice. There's a lot of things that are happening um, around the, the the justice system in our country today. And I think it's important for us to touch upon this. And, and Tyron, I know that you've been in the middle of this for for a little bit of time. You know, being from Ferguson, Missouri. But you've also put together a coalition of leaders just right out of the gate um, to, to help fight racism and help support change in the justice system. So tell everybody about that, because I think it's incredibly powerful what you've been able to do. Well, you know, it's a, it's a blessing time that we're in right now, because as we're sitting here having this, you know, one on one talk on live on Instagram, um, a lot of things that you can do and the ways you can connect now a lot mm. different than the 90s or the 80s. So when you think about some of the injustice that we're seeing on television and on Instagram posts, it's a blessing that we have that opportunity because it's not like they're, they just started happening. It's not like it hasn't been a long um, history behind it, but I think the fact that social media is so powerful and the, the ability to see things right now um, puts you in a position where you kinda, you, you're you not as desensitized as you may be in the past because if you don't see it or if it's not around you, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I just basically put together a coalition of people who just People that were in my network that I knew that were passionate, that I knew that um, really cared about humans being treated like humans, not really a black and white thing, mm -hmm. but just making it black and white. And Kevin Weaver is a president of Atlantic Records on um, uh, West Coast. And he's just, we had a long conversation about an hour just talking about it in, in ways that we want to make um, steps towards a solution because we can get interest and we can get people um, to hear us and we can get the whole world to see it. But at that point, I feel like it's a solution that needs to happen. Um, one that take the current situation to make everyone recognize that we are all together. I understand not because I want this thing to blow over, but I understand mm. because I really understand for my own self. And I feel like it's not right. And I'm telling you, I don't have the perfect you know, answer, but I want to let you know that I'm with you and I'm fighting for you and we are all equal and that type of energy is the beginning because it's a lot of people that don't want to listen, a lot of people that don't want to, you know, give any benefit of the doubt. And, you know, some people just are ignorant to the fact that it even exists because they have not participated in racism and they have not been taught it through childhood, through their parental units. And because of that, they don't think it exists. And sometimes that ignorance of just not knowing and not being sensitive to the facts, it can almost be the same as participating in it. So mm -hmm. I just got a group of guys and I started thinking of my um, homie, Nate Parker, um, director, actor, um, The Birth of a Nation, 
Tuskegee Airmen, and he's just very vocal um, about his thoughts about equality. So I reach out to him, reach out to my homie Van Lathan, reach out to my homie um, Evan from TMZ. Um, obviously, him being Jewish, I think he has a certain perspective as well. And then, you know, WME actually reached out to me, um, reached out to me through Brad Slater, and he said he wanted to be a part of something real. And UTA, obviously, they said, Tyra, you know, we could get a strong voice. Let us know what we can do to coordinate. So I just got too many good people that I've been mm. blessed to be around and too many positive people that music can affect change in a certain way. It can heal. It can make someone get through. It can really um, be your mouthpiece at times. So when I think of the music category, and I think of the funding category, then I think of, you know, maybe I chime in, hit my only killer mic or something like those people that are able to uncap because at the end of the day, it's all about uncapping. You can pour as much water as you want on top of a bottle, but if you don't uncap it, it'll never go in. So I feel like different types of people uncap different types of people. And don't sweat the technique. At the end of the day, we're trying to make a change. We're trying to make, you know, our world be filled with love and not so, you know, so many preconceived notions and just people just that expect a race to be a certain type of way. And it's very it's dangerous. It's scary. A lot of people are acting out of fear. And hurt mm. people hurt. Well, hopefully I can be, hopefully I can be someone that you can call upon as well. Yeah. Now, that, now that we have this, with this good relationship and, and the fact that, you know, you and I are both linked through UTA and, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an image I saw today of, of two people at the bottom of a hill. And they said racism in, in America was sort of like the path behind us, but what we need to do and it showed this big hill that we need to still climb. And I think the efforts that you're putting in, um, along with so many other people, and those that you're bringing to the table, will both um, accelerate that and allow more people to follow as we as we as we climb to the top of this mountain, if you will. So, if, if you need me, I'm here, and, and I'm and I'm glad you're on the show talking about talking about this. And one of the things you you mentioned, you know, you, you've been in this before. Um, you've been a part of this. You've seen it firsthand and, and growing up and, and, and being from Ferguson, Missouri, Michael Brown, who uh, who, who was killed as, as well. Um, you, you, you've seen, like I said, you've seen it firsthand. So talk a little bit about the element of where you grew up and, 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 and that environment and how it's attributed to where you are today. You know, the element that I grew up, I grew up in St. Louis, but I specifically live in a county called Ferguson. And when you like like yesterday I saw some some police officer basically crash into a man, got out of the car, threw him on the ground and handcuffed him. That's in Florissant, which Ferguson Florissant is a school district that we in. So it's all St. Louis, but it's all such a small region that it's enough crime that it'll put us fifteenth in the world overall. Sometimes the number one in the US as far as um crime per capita. So when you think about those elements and you start thinking about COVID-19, you start thinking about, you know, people being trapped in the house and not being able to earn an income, and, and then they figure this is going to extend longer. You know, when a riot kicked off, especially when it was the same topic, the same type of situation mm -hmm. as the, the Michael Brown situation, it was only a matter of time before everybody turned up. You know what I mean? You know, St. Louis has been crazy. It's been crazy the last couple of days. It's been crazy the last week. And I'm visualizing it from a kid I've seen 10 or 15 times police brutality. My friends getting beat with billy clubs and put phone books in their shirts and they don't bruise and they make us watch. And you can't say nothing. You can't do nothing. I've seen it 10 times. I've been stuffed into a, a paddy wagon truck, you know, in the mid, mid summertime, St. Louis, humid with no air conditioning. There's 15 of us in there and only C10. And we can't breathe and we're sitting there for three or four hours. Like, and we didn't even do anything wrong. But it's just a mentality to teach you a lesson. It's a mentality of the not respecting authority because we don't trust authority. And everybody's scared of everybody. I'm scared of you because I feel like you're going to do what well, I saw the last person that was dressed like you do. I'm afraid of you because the last time I get the benefit of the doubt, I got shot while I was on the job and I mm. lost my life. So all these different things play a factor. But as long as we keep sweeping it under the rug, it'll never do anything but compound. The grub of the residue is just going to continue to compound, and it's going to continue to get worse. And each time, each ride, notice each ride was worse. Rodney King, Mike Brown was worse than that because it was global. People came from all around the world. This one's worse than that. 
because the riots didn't just take place in Ferguson. Now it's taking place around the world. And if we don't do this right, if we don't come up with solid solutions, you know, we don't put ourselves in position to be prepared. We need to preface. Like, hey, right now, everyone needs comfort. Everybody needs to know that we're together. Mm -hmm. The next step is what active and realistic changes can we make in a timely manner to immediately impact? Obviously, that's legislation. It may be bills. It may be voting. It may be, you know, going against, you know, um, someone that's in the office that you don't feel like is doing a good job or doing a great representation of the aggregate. You can do all of those different things. But then at a the certain point, you got to implement, execute, implement, execute, implement, execute, check and make sure stuff went right. If something was wrong, take it out, replace it with what you need, and mm -hmm. then execute. And you got to you gotta have a team that's willing to be exhausted with doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And also put in a position where they're like, okay, you know, yeah, I know we're going to get back to our day-to-day -day in a little bit, but I'm still committed to this. And it still means something to me because I got a great opportunity and a unique opportunity to be the megaphone, a quiet conversation that's had in a few houses to put on the megaphone where the whole world can hear. You know what I mean? And everybody got a different way to uncap. But you, you almost didn't have that opportunity. To be in the position that you are today and, and, to, and, and to go to college and to reach the UFC, you know, you, you grew up in a, in a family, 14 kids. Uh, you, you, you said several times you, you were evicted. You know, you had to break back into the house in order to take a cold shower. I mean, there's any number of different directions that you could have gone, you know, instead yeah. of getting hit by a billy club, you could have maybe picked up the billy club and hit the police officer back and been in jail. Um, you were, you were in, in, a, in a gang as well. So what was, what was the, the in, innate part of you that kept you not going down that path? You know, I didn't, really, I didn't really choose not to go down that path, to be honest. I actually chose to go down that path originally. Uh, I was in a situation where, I'm like, you know, I walk past this neighborhood. And to me, it felt like, if you ever see the movie New Jack City, uh, when, when, when Wesley Snipes was playing Nino Brown, he took over this um, project complex called, you know, I forgot what it was called. I want to say the Carter just because. It was uh, the Carter. Right now, it was the Carter, all right. He took, down, he took down the Carter. And um, at the end of the day, he was just such a, you know, aggressive, you know, just nah, he just didn't care about anybody type of businessman. And it was the same type of people and characters in that neighborhood. So when I walked past that, I felt like I was walking past the Carter every day at home. So I was like, all right, I got to make a choice. Do I got to keep ask, answering questions about why I'm wearing this color in this street, in this neighborhood, where I'm mm -hmm. going, where my street at, you know, what set I'm claiming, anything that I had to ask every day. Finally, I just walked to the bottom of the hill and got jumped in the game because I didn't feel like dealing with it. I wasn't scared, per se, because I felt I was tough. Like, I was little. I was little and I always had to defend myself, and I was mm -hmm. ready to fight. Like, nobody nobody could ever say I was not ready to fight. So I got jumped into the game for, I guess, for protection. Um, obviously, my father wasn't a strong player in my life, so those are the guys I looked up to. And I'm not proud of it, but I've, I've been fighting way before the octagon, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's what I looked up to, whoever made the most money, Whoever had the most juice, all the girls like the guys that, you know, had the fresh pair of shoes. They only wore a couple of times, you know what I mean? Crazy cars with, like, rims and Dayton's and stuff. Like, I glorify that. That's what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted. And um, that's why I went down that road. And I was blessed that God kind of just got involved every time. Like, I was living. We got evicted from my house. Got evicted from my house. I was... In eighth grade, I got evicted from my house, and I was going into my freshman year of high school. I just got suspended for 90 days for a fight. So I missed a whole first semester of high wow. school. I missed everything. And I was mad because all my homies got a chance to see the girls that came in, the first from different <laughs> middle schools, homecoming, all this stuff. I missed all of that, right? So I'm in this um, student support center for kids that, you know, get suspended all the time. And it's just what I did. I got suspended almost every week. So I got into this big fight, and in this big fight, I had been recommended to get 90 days three other times. So on the fourth time, even though if I felt like it was self-defense, I had to get the – they had to give me the 90-day bid. Right. So during that period, 
I was just looking around. I'm like, this dude's going to get shot. This dude's going to get go to jail. This dude is going to be on the street. And I just had this epiphany. And it was like a light switch moment for me. And I know that's not normal. I know it was God. So I just stopped and I froze. And I saw everybody for where they were going. And I'm like, you are the company you keep. So how am I going to do anything if I'm around this company? And I went mm -hmm. from that point, and I had went from getting suspended almost every week, in school suspension, detention. You know what I mean? Like I would fight teachers. Like I would, I was, I was terrible. And I flipped the switch. Never got written up ever again. No referrals. Um, almost a straight A student. Three point eight. Um, they put me what? every ROTC. I broke every record. I broke every record for the high school. And I just shattered everything. And everybody, it was all driven off of people telling me I couldn't do it. You, you, wait, wait, you, are you sure it wasn't, you sure it was like the people around you that you saw that you didn't want to be like, or was your, it was um, your mother and that tough love? Cause, cause I've, I've, I've seen your mother talk about how, you know, with all those kids and how she didn't, she didn't d play that. She yeah. didn't deal with any of that. And I know that she wanted to make sure that you weren't on the street. She wanted to make sure that you had the best situation. She wanted to make sure that you were, you know, you were able to take advantage of everything, all the gifts that you have. So I know your mom yeah. contributed to it as well. You know, my mom contributed to it, but some, some, some of these journeys you got to take by yourself. You know what I mean? My mom set the foundation, and she, she let us know that it was okay to go to a dark spot sometimes. You know, if you get into a fight, we all fight it. You get in this situation. So my mom wasn't unrealistic because she had to, she had to mold us for what was out there. You know, we lived in, we lived in um part of Ferguson where it was three different gangs in like four four different streets. So it was every day, gunshots every day. So she didn't want me to go out there and not be prepared. But some of these lessons you had to learn for yourself. And I think maybe it's because of the way she conditioned me. Maybe it's because the way I saw her sacrifice working three jobs, 13 of us all by herself. She showed me and I felt like I owed it to her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I felt like she made sure I went to every wrestling camp, every... Um, you know, football thing, I never miss a season. I've been an athlete nonstop with no breaks since I was 10 years old. Never taken a break. Never had an off season. So from 10 to 38, I've been in the grind. No breaks. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask, you know, when, when you started off your, your UFC career, you know, you, you came out of the gate undefeated. Yeah. Right? And, um, and there's, an, there's um, another interview that you did that you said that you are raised in the dark. Right. Yeah. I know that's kind of like the Bane quote. Right. Yeah. But how, how have those experiences kind of contributed to your overall success um, in the UFC? I mean, because because you start thinking about organized fight with rules, um, a time period, a referee there to stop it if it get ugly and no weapons are allowed in there. So I'm from a different element. So I don't per se get my nerves don't come from being afraid to fight or being afraid of my opponent. You know, my last fight, many people would have gave up, many people would have quit, many people would have took the, you know, I mean, the easy way out. It's not in my butt, it's not in my body to do that, you know, because mm -hmm. I grew up in an era where crime was showing weakness, and you fought because you fought for respect, you fought for territory, you fought because somebody fought somebody you was cool with, you fought for your family, and if somebody disrespects you, you fought. So, so many problems that I had in the day was solved through fighting. So now fighting is registered in my mind as that. So when I have to separate that from me competing as a sport, it's a whole different mindset. Mm. Like I'm willing to maybe kill somebody over here, but on this side, I want to do just enough to make the referee get involved. Mm. That's it. I don't need to land seven other hits because mm. I feel like it takes away from the performance if you, if you throw too much gravy over your food. Right. So, so, so in my in my mind, I think those those lessons that I grew just knowing, being in those situations where it was like dudes chasing us or the shooting or like just knowing that if you can't outrun this dude, if you if he catch you, you might die. Like maybe I didn't think about it that deeply at the moment, but when someone's chasing you and they on the on the opposing side of the field and you run, I never thought, what if I fall and this motherfucker catches me? Mm -hmm. And I'm here, and everybody that's with him is here. My dude's in front of me. What's gonna happen to me? And think about that. That's that's way more intimidating. That's way more life threatening than the octagon. Where I'm trained, 
I'm skilled. I feel like I'm strong. I'm powerful. I got a high IQ. I feel like I'm explosive. I can hit you with one punch and knock you out. I can take a punch. I can stop a shot. I can get a shot. I got a lot of things that are helping me stay safe in there. You know what I mean? Versus the elements of outside. Fences, grass, ditches, darkness, unknown territory, all those different things. You got you to gotta quickly be able to shift on that stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, what someone just said in the in the in the chat room, they they said that um, your childhood almost in, in in a lot of ways gave you a lot of the instinctual abilities in order to fight in in the UFC, yeah. and I, and I think that there's a there's a physical nature to it, but then there's also sort of that mental change. So, what were some of the positive virtues that came from your community that allowed you to sort of accomplish your goals? I mean, the positive the positive thing is when you say it takes a village, right? It takes a village to raise a child. And my neighborhood was really, the whole neighborhood could whoop your ass. The way it went. If you did something that we all knew you shouldn't have been doing, by the time you get to your house, the West family could have gave me a whooping, the Chambers family could have, I could have got the Jones family. From four houses before my house on Brotherton, I could have got tapped three, four times. And, and two of them stuttered, so there's double hits. When they're trying to figure out what they talk to you, <laughs> they talk to you and they spank you. And then by the time you get home, nobody felt sorry for you. You got it again. And it really ingrained in your mind, maybe I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? So I think the, the accountability of the neighborhood and, you know, you didn't have to have much. You didn't have to look like much. Just take care of it. Don't throw trash in it. You know what I mean? Don't disrespect it. We, we, we know y'all got to get y'all money. You know, we ain't here to judge you on what you have to do to make it happen. But don't be... Don't be passing that poison to, you know, somebody's mom and don't be right here making the corner look crazy. And that's the real talks the neighborhood had. Mm -hmm. We don't have those talks. Everybody's so scared. Everybody in their house. Was there, was there one, one person or one group in the community that really allowed you to, to lift yourself up? Um, I, I mean, to be honest, it's really my mom, to be real. My mom was a neighborhood. She was like the universal mom. Everybody knew her. Every dope dealer, every gang banger. Every priest, every saint, every sinner, everybody knew my mom. And our house was like a hangout house. So it would be 20 people there maybe. And everybody felt comfortable there. They didn't feel judged. And she just earned her stripes. She was already certified from what she, what she did in the street. And, you know, she just had that reputation and she had that ability. Like, remember I talked earlier about uncapping. Right. She can she could uncap the person from the trap. She can uncap the person that from struggle, from drug addiction, from prostitution, from drug use, from drug selling. Like anybody in that in that realm of you know, just that lifestyle that you know it, you can either go to jail or die. She can she can go in there. She would walk into a crack house. She didn't care. You know what I mean? She would walk into someone's house, say, "Get out of here," and she would just do that. She was just so bold that I they showed me. When you're bold and you committed and you're passionate, you can make things happen that other people can't. My mom showed me that, you know what I mean? She was bold, she was passionate. When everybody's like, she got, I remember one time I was in Hawaii training BJP. I was training him for a fight and I had a fighter of mine. He had a fight in uh, Brazil. And this dude didn't have his visa. Mm -hmm. So we got to fly in two days and he don't have a visa. I don't have a visa. I'm like, I got to call this fight off. My mom, the kid went up there, drove from St. Louis to Chicago four or five hours, got denied, accepted, and came back. My mom basically grabbed him up by his ear, <laughs> put him in the car, drove him back up there, and not only did she get him his visa that night, she right. also got my visa, and I was in um, Hawaii. I don't know how she did it, but some people are just unmovable, and they won't allow you, you know what I mean? And we need more people like that. So that's why I said it's time to unleash Mama Woodley. Mama Woodley's going to be a part of the coalition. I think everyone needs that mom, that mom yes. in the neighborhood right now. And I think she can draw people together and, you know, do it in an authentic way because I don't want people involved that are going to be chasing attention, clout, clicks, and follows. Like, this is from the heart. If you if you in it for that, you're going to be out of it for that. Mm. Man, um, I can I can tell you a bunch of stories about my mom, have, how she's done the same type of thing. I mean, I went to the University of Michigan, and I almost didn't I almost didn't get a scholarship to the university. And my mom tells me to wait outside the head coach's office. Got you. She said, "Hey, wait outside. 
I'll be right back. And about <laughs> 15 minutes later, she comes out and she says, I have a scholarship. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what happened? You she know? wouldn't need no problem. I was like, I was like, I was like, what I was like, what happened? She said, Well, you know, she said, no, my son has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. And, you know, if you tell him you can't do something, then uh, maybe he'll just go to the University of Washington and he'll play for that team and he'll come back and beat you guys in the Rose Bowl. That's what, that's what she told Lloyd Carr. Yeah. And, and, and the history yeah. of it was University of Michigan was in the Rose Bowl with, you know, with University of Washington several, several times before that. And the coincidence of it all is that I ended up getting the scholarship and we went to the national championship and we played against Washington State. So wow. it's kind of crazy how these situations yeah. occur. It but, crazy. But it's, but it's true. You know, it, was, it was written. It, it was written. It, it's the strength, the strength of, a, of a mother and the way that they're able to, to teach their child um, and the things that they're able to instill with them last, last an entire lifetime. And, and I love the fact of how much you love to talk about your neighborhood and how much you love to talk about I where love you come my from. neighborhood, man. Like I don't I don't I don't feel no no way about Ferguson like that. Like that's why I took offense when Trump was like Ferguson is the most dangerous city in the in the country. Don't talk about my city, you ain't never been there before. You know what I mean? I take it personal because I seen guys like me that go on and get a um, college education, be an all American, first Big Twelve champion in the school's history go out there, you know, and I was sixth or seventh on the Olympic ladder for a while. A lot of people don't know that, but I was chasing those Olympic dreams. Went on to fight in the UFC, win titles, do movies, do music, do production now, and just basically every time somebody try to box me, I just bust through that box. Every time they tell me I can't do something, I just do double, and I don't even, I don't even stun on it. I just do it, and I just keep it moving because you show people by your actions. God said, know them by their fruit. If you got a lot of talk and your basket is empty, then I don't want to really hear from you. But if I'm looking at your basket and you got apples and oranges and grapes and your basket looks to be full, yes. then you may have experienced some, some – you may have experienced the, the harvest. You maybe have reaped what you've sown. Otherwise, you really don't have anything to talk about. So when people look at me, you can say a lot of things, but you see food in a lot of different categories. You see, okay, he decided to do music. Boom. He got over a million plus streams with a song with Wiz Khalifa for his first single. Yeah, and like people tell you not to do it because an athlete is not supposed to be able to be a musician. But guess what? It's all art, mixed mm -hmm. martial art, recording art, theater, acting, stunts, broadcast, TV, podcast, motivational speaking. It's all art, and you got to stroke. You got to stroke the different. You know what I mean? The, the different patterns depend on what you're talking about. I'm not going to talk about the same thing you know, to college kids, and I'm going to talk about to elementary kids, you know what I mean? I'm not going to use my TMZ filter when I'm on ESPN. Right. Like fire, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I got to I gotta be able to be able to make those audibles. And I think in life, we got to be able to make audibles. If I'm in a mm. situation, I got to think of the, hey, if I do this, it's going to take me that way. If I do that, it's going to take me that way. And we got to make, we got to think before we act. And mm. that accountability in self first to think before you act and then have a circle of people that are going to hold you accountable, whether it's other law enforcers that say, Hey man, we're not going to let you do this crooked bullshit. We're going to call you out on it. Not because we are whistleblower or snitch because we are supposed to get the trust back and we want that trust back. And we want to be seen as heroes in our neighborhood and not the adversary to the, to the civilians because they're civil servants. Their job is to serve the community. And if you think about it as you, as you, someone in the community, if you're paying taxes to facilitate their salary, you don't want to be harassed. And you don't want to be beat. You don't want to be killed by them. Right. So that trust is so important right now. So it's going to have to come from the inside out. Mm -hmm. good, good police officers are going to have to hold the crooked police officers accountable. And also the African-American police officers is going to have to bring the non-African-American police officers up to speed on what the psychological problems may be in the community. Right. They all stem through slavery. Nobody wants to give credit. Everybody wants to say, oh, it's 400 years ago. Let's not talk about it. No. It's an economic standpoint. Yep. It's a, it's a mentality standpoint of self-worth when you treat it lower than the lowest. It's a standpoint of being stripped away from family. And you see a lot of broken homes without mom and dad there. Mm -hmm. It was taken away without even, without even a choice at that point in time. And you start thinking about the hard work. 
and work for basically nothing, blood, sweat, and tears, and then you get to the position where you don't have the ability to save. Your diet consumes are the worst of the pig parts or whatever's left. Mm. And, you worry, and you wonder why diabetes and cholesterol and blood pressure, all these things you can all trace back. And it's not to say, okay, this is enabled, but you got to look at everybody like me. I come out of Ferguson. I'm from the mud. Like people say I'm from the mud because it sounds good in the rap song, but no. Nah. Like I really know people that shoot people, and I know people that have shot that person, and I'm in the same room with them, and I don't know if they can mm. go back at each other. I've been in that situation many, many times. I've been on the corner where drug addicts come to your window like zombies, and I'm sitting out there, and I got to wait until my guy collect his money. I've been through that. So at the end of the day, none of this stuff mm -hmm. scares me, and me speaking out don't scare me. I'm willing to lose my job for it. I'm willing to lose. If it comes to my kids having a better life and my 16-year-old son not crying and being scared to drive his new car because he likes to dress with hoods on and – you know, he a part of the culture, so his attire is going to match it. I don't want him to have to think about that. And I got to say, hey, son, do this. Hands on the steering wheel. Yes, sir. No, sir. Start to record your video. Comply mm -hmm. complete. I don't, why should we have to do that? We shouldn't. Yeah. We have to restore that trust. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think trust is uh, trust is the, the most important within ed and all communities. And I think it's the, the trust that's ultimately been lost in, in so many different ways that we need to be able to rebuild and we need those that have powerful platforms like, like you do to be able to amplify and talk about it. Um, that's and for, for everybody out that, that's out there, I hope that you're able to, you know, uh, pass along some questions, Tyron, because um, I know he, he, wants to, he wants to set the record straight. If anybody's got any questions, just, just pass them out and then uh, we'll be able to get around to them at the very end. I just want to make sure we remind you. Um, and we, we talk about, uh, trust how did how did you find your way to trusting others you know you've, you've been in these situations you've been in in this community um how did you how did you establish a trust in order to, to create you know, like a win-win a, a scenario for your own life you know i'm a little different than everybody else because i give everybody face value whether you're a bum or a billionaire i'm gonna shoot you the same and people that are very successful and we would look at them from a, uh, basically a position of status and be like, these guys are movers and shakers. I've been around those guys, and those guys enjoy me because I'm not trying to be like them. I'm not kissing mm -hmm. their butt, and I'm going to treat them regular. I'm going to treat them normal. Sometimes that's refreshing. And then when you have somebody else that's um, in a position where um, they may be having hard times or they may be homeless, they need to also recognize that this could be us. This could be any one of us at any point in time mm -hmm. for any reason. And that we got your back in that bush. You wish I see my guy Asia on here um, for any reason. And that's mentally the way I got to keep myself. That's the way I stay low. That's the way I stay humble. So when I'm looking, listening to everything that's going on, even the quarantine itself, it mm. made us all remind us that when all you can't jump on a private plane and you can't go into Miami for, you know, this little boat ride and just hop back on a plane back, when you have to be amongst the people that you love, Mm. You have to actually parent. You got to homeschool, <laughs> right. and you got to be a chef. And you got to be a mediator. And you got to be all these different things. It reminds you of what's important. Mm -hmm. So I think for the people that are really passionate right now, and I think that's the reason why we're seeing a, a better response overall. I mean, it's a long road. The fight's not over with. But we're seeing a lot of progress in people that are non-black that are speaking out on what's right because it's right. You know what I mean, not making it a black and white issue, but just making it a black and white issue. This is human. This is standard. This this ain't even the actual. This is standard. If you got blood in your veins and your heartbeat, this is what you get standard. That's all we're asking for. Mm. And after that, hopefully the respect will be gained and hopefully the trust can be given back. But it's not going to be overnight. It's, it's a lot of years, a lot of years. You know, think about the, the law enforcement and the way that it was built. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of lynching, a lot of killing, and no accountability, and that's the way it was. How was you said what? Well, I was, just, I was, you know, you're, you're, you're talking a lot of, of 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 the of the unfortunate history of our country, and and you also talked a lot, a lot about you know people sitting at home, and so you know with the the coalition of leaders that you've brought together, just a, a question: how how do you want? How, how, what advice would you give to people that are sitting at home that want to make a positive change? 
right, um, to affect the justice system and to end racism in, in their community. What, uh, would, what, would, what advice would you give them? The, the advice I would immediately give them is to look in the mirror real quick and mm. see what is your best opportunity to reach the most people in the least amount of time. If you, if you are a person that are, is an accountant, you're going to have access to a lot of different records, the way to do things, to maybe make logistics go real smooth, that you may make this whole movement go seamless because we don't make those accounting mistakes. You may not be the person that needs to be on a YouTube video mm -hmm. or the one that's blasting stuff on social media. Stay, everybody stay in their lane. So I would acknowledge, okay, if my platform is speaking to people, because of my visibility on social media and because of the sport I do, it's a base there. I'm going to use everything I got to tap into that category. Mm -hmm. If it's a recording artist and if he can do something where his music and drawing people in for a good cause and that's the way we get their attention, then obviously he's going to do that. You know, and, and if it's no matter what the whatever your task is and whatever guy, God gifted us all differently. You know what your gift is. And sometimes we want somebody else's gift because it looks dope. And Seth Curry, life looks so perfect. And even though I, I can wash the best car on earth and nobody can not wash me in a car, <laughs> I mean, I want to be the basketball player when I know God gave me the gift to, you know, pay attention to every detail and make this thing look flawless, right? You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's the first thing. And once you get to that point, now you execute, you stay committed, you stay consistent, and you stay relentless, and you don't allow time, you don't allow other things outside of this, because there are a few things in life that you're going to be able to do that you know 100% is the right thing, and this is one. You don't even have to question. You know it's the right thing. Like, just think about that. You can go and talk to a million people with a million different hidden agendas, and you can go and... You know, blast this thing across Instagram Live, but when you go out there and you stand for what's right because it's right, that's what an activist is, standing up for what's right because it's right. There's nothing more liberating. There's nothing more that, that will satisfy you more than to know you're doing the right thing. You know what I mean? One of, one of the things I've seen a lot in, in, in many of the protests is there have been a lot of kids. Yeah. Uh, there have been a lot of kids that have marched with their parents. There have been a lot of kids that have, have stood with their friends and make, made signs. Um, a lot of kids that have been on the shoulder of their, of their parents. And I think the, the young people um, and those young kids um, have received that message and have received that strength from, from their community and from people like yourself. And I know you like to engage with young people in order to make a positive impact on, on them as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's where it starts at. You know, the last time these riots were taking place in 2015, um, I didn't go and spread it from a rooftop, and I didn't go and, like, have a million people video and throw it on Instagram. But I went to go speak to over 40 schools, mm. and, and pr um, primarily in the Ferguson, Florida School District, because I felt like at that point, the amount of corruption, the amount of time, that the issues, the core issues on both sides, from the trust of the law enforcement and also from the fear of the citizens, especially African-Americans. I sat there and I was like, you know what? How can I make a change? And I really didn't have a lot of answers for how I can change everything right now. Mm -hmm. And I just said, hey, I can't tell this man how to be a different man. But I want to make it sound like I want you to be more like me. So I didn't feel like that was what I should do. So I spoke to elementary kids because those are the kids that are going to have to have confidence in themselves. Yes. And once you have confidence in yourself, you're less likely to allow someone to tell you who you are mm. or allow a word, the end bomb or whatever the case may be to make you feel less of yourself because you have such a strong, um, such a strong sense of who you are and self-worth. From that point, you get to the middle school kids. This is when they go through the identity crisis. This is when a lot of clicks start happening. This is when you have to make a choice. Do I want to go with what I feel is me, what I feel is right, or what I feel is popular? And this is what everybody goes through. They came from different elementary schools. Yes. And then high school is when they make the choice on which direction they're going to go. So when you can talk to a high school, you know, kid, be real. When I tell my son, hey, I know you're old enough to act grown, but you're also old enough to get age and you're old enough to be a dad. And that's kind of harsh, mm -hmm. but 
it puts a reality into you. You're old enough to act grown, but you're also old enough to get AIDS and you're also old enough to be a dad. And that kind of way to talk to kids. I mean, sometimes you got to put a little fear in them because we don't want to be accountable. We, we see it on TV. It's so glorified. But that's the way I'm coming in to talk to the high school kids. I'm coming to talk to them about being cool your freshman and sophomore year, effing up your GPA, and now you stuck like Chuck your senior year, and you're watching everybody go to college, and you are not. You know what I mean? That's how I have to talk to them because that's the way they communicate to us. You know what I mean? If you want to be on an adult level, you want to be <laughs> rated as us, now I have to talk to you like that. Without cursing, without swearing, but real and straight to the point where you can have an opportunity to see yourself mm. and see that if you don't fix this, it's not going to be good for you down the road. That's a that's a powerful message to everybody that's out there that are, that are watching right now, Tyron Woodley, um, and uh, ho hopefully everybody is able to to take that and pass that on to their own children, um, and, and, to, and to their own kids. Um, and I know that you're setting up a 501c3 in Ferguson, so um, I'd love to be able to support that and, and all the work that you're doing in the community. So I wanted to, to, to kind of switch over to a couple questions from, from the audience. Okay. Um, so Swell Do, he you know, asked, you know, how, did you, how did you even get started in the MMA? Because a, a lot of people don't realize, like, you don't just wake up one day and then yeah. all of a sudden decide to go fight someone. Sometimes you got to do a, a, a John Smith low, low single and yeah, all right, all right, you know about that low single. <laughs> oh, um, I know about it. I know about it. Yeah, John Smith, my guy, too. He's, he's a phenomenal coach. But um, I was a wrestler in college, and my goal was to make the Olympic team. Actually, my original goal was to be an NCAA champion and then make the Olympic team. And I felt like I was the best in the country. I felt like I trained the hardest, especially my last year. I did everything right. I mean, by the book, you know, I know I was the best and nobody outworked me. And the way it works in wrestling is one tournament. When you qualify to one tournament, wherever you place in that tournament is your All-American status for the year. Other sports, football, you got a whole season, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 10 games where you can prove it to them, you know what I mean? In NFL, you got, you know, a whole football season to make a Pro Bowl or, you know what I mean, whatever. But in wrestling, you can have, a 500 year, you can show up to one tournament, and you can kill everybody. And if you win that one tournament, you're the national champion. The best dude in the whole country in wrestling. What? So, yeah, that's just, how it Wait, works. wait, just one tournament? One tournament. It's one tournament. No, you got to, it's, 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 it's one or two tournaments to get there. It's a Big 12. It was the Big 12 for me. Maybe it's SEC, maybe it's Big 10, but it's a conference tournament first. And every conference has, you know, where, Maybe you're in the top three in the conference. or the top two, you go automatically. Then they look at what you're ranked and your chances. Because they want to see if we let you out here on a wild card, what's your chances of actually All-American? Because if you're All-American, even if you're not on my team, you're going to make the conference look good and the conference is going to get more money. So then there were wild card guys out that may, may have had a bad conference tournament, but they know, you know, they probably can pull it together and get, you know, get some hardware the next week in Nationals, then they'll wild card them. But there's a lot, of, a lot of people have done done wrestling. You know, you yeah. have your 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 uh your fireman's carry and your and your double leg takedowns, but it doesn't mean you want to knock people out like you do. Yeah, you know, I just I just was coaching and I was trying to make this Olympic team and I had injuries and there was a lot of politics. And then the weight was I, mean, I had to wake one sixty three is like that's very like nearly impossible for me to do. And I was watching the Ultimate Fighter show, and I knew I'm like Rashad Evans. Okay, he we wrestled against him all the time. I know him. You know what I love about this conversation? We 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 covered so much. We covered so much ground, and now we're talking about uh. Now we're talking about wrestling. Like I was a wrestler growing up, and you know I I wrestled all throughout high school. So I remember the days when I had to cut weight. You know I was at 180 pounds. What state are you from? So Maryland. Uh, Maryland's got a dope wrestling state. Well, you know, you're, you're looking at a pretty successful wrestler from Maryland. You know, I, I tried to do it in, in college, but I, you know, I had to do the, the football thing. But I think there's there's a lot of lessons, and you talk about it as well. There's and and nobody's asking this question. I, I want to ask this question: What's the most important lesson that you can take from wrestling that you can apply to life? What's the most important lesson that you can take from MMA that you can apply to life? 
I mean, the most important thing I can say for wrestling is wrestling is a sport where you can never judge a book by its cover. You look at an athlete, he may not be tall, he may not have his body all ripped up with abs, but he may hit you with that fireman's carry, he might have a <laughs> technique, or he might just be in shape, he might just be able to tie up your wrist, or, you know, keep the match real close where you can't win. There's so many different ways to win. There's so many different things that affect the outcome in a wrestling match that it prepares you for the the audibles of life when you get thrown a curveball and how you respond and how you react. Because wrestling is all about sensory. You mm -hmm. drill a hundred different ways to do this, a hundred different ways to do that, a hundred different ways to do this, and you cover all your bases. That way when you get in those positions or you get in those predicaments, you just react and respond and you don't even think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest lesson that I can get from wrestling. But MMA is like a balance. It's not so much about the fight. The best fighters aren't the champions. The best fighters aren't making the most money. And the champions are sometimes making less than the guys that are fighting the super fights. So it's about the balance and also the self-awareness that I was talking about. But if the kid was in elementary school and they remember that conversation I had with him about self-worth and knowing what you're worth and not letting somebody put you on clearance and putting a red tag on you. And then they get to the UFC at the age 20 and they remember that conversation and they get down at the table and they start negotiating and somebody's trying to hit them for lower than what they were. They can't mm. even let it happen. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's how I feel like it, it pays forward. So that's the thing. It's balance, knowing your worth, knowing the when to stand your ground, but also know when to back up. And that's what I've learned recently, when to back up. Because UFC, I don't, they don't have to pay me nothing. They don't have to let me fight. They don't have to, there's nothing that's making them do anything. And I don't run their organization. I can have a conspiracy theorist mental of how they're operating stuff or whatever. But at the end of the day, it don't matter. They're going to offer me a fight. I'm going to say yes or I'm going to say no. Mm. And if I win more than I lose, I make more money. If I keep winning, I get back to my belt. And that's really op overly simplifying it. But I don't own their organization, so I had to know when to step back. When they when they had their reasoning for stepping, you know, to the plate very strongly in certain areas, I got to respect that. And be like it's a reason why they feel like they don't want to take any more steps back. And I'm gonna meet them at that one point, and we're gonna pause right there. Well, I, I'll t I'll tell you this, you know, whether it's you know UFC. Uh, or some of the other endeavors that you've been able to participate in, which I ultimately respect, or the fact that you're able to do a lot of TV stuff now, and, and now you're going to be on Titan as Titan well. Titan Games, yeah, yeah. Titan, Titan Games, Games. I'm, I'm going to be watching one I'm Man, gonna be watching that, episode. That was a real shout-out to The Rock, NBC, the Titan Games, the whole crew, the whole staff, and whoever was the evil scientist that was twiddling his thumbs in the basement coming up with these courses. But I'll tell you this, you talk to The Rock, you ask him if I can come on Titan Games as well. And I'll go get, I'll challenge you. How about that? All right, hey. <laughs> you better get, hey, you better do some pre-Titan game training because I didn't. <laughs> and I was made a believer ASAP because it's very taxing on your body. You know what I mean? I'm glad I did it, you know what I mean? Satisfied with the competitive fire. Competitive fire was, you know, satisfied. But at the end of the day, if you're going to do it, you better be ready. <laughs> so last last questions. Uh, last last question. I know you talked to a lot of uh, groups of, of young kids. And you said in, in one of your last interviews, you said um, up until you've got the last drip. It, it, until the fact that, you know, you're saying up until the last breath of your body, right, you got to give it, Right. Yeah. Um, what, what did you What did you mean by by that? Um, I feel like that came from a, a place of where you lived, where you grew up, and the things that you've been through. And even when you talked about on in your Instagram uh, live coming out of this last fight, where you unfortunately didn't win, and where you said a lot of people wouldn't be able to 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 talk about it because they they only talk when they win. They don't talk when they unfortunately lose, yeah. right? And you you were talking about this fight. So talk in your closing. Uh, about that that drip in your body and and your commitment to people you know i just feel like we created for greatness and i feel like we all got to recognize that what god gave us the gift he gave us is greatness and we chose to label certain people as entertainers celebrities and stars that's a choice mm -hmm. but someone that's a law enforcer someone that's a fireman someone that's a teacher a lot of people put a lot of respect on teachers names after this homeschooling 
because I'm telling you, homeschooling is more than a notion. So respect got put in, and I guarantee you, if the teachers all rally up and they want that raise, we're going to give it to them right now. We're going to vote yes for the extra taxes to pay these teachers more money because now we have to, we had to do what they do and we respect them more and how difficult it is to do with 30 kids, less known two or three. So at the end of the day, I think coming from coming from the just everything that's going on is just really putting us in a position where we got to just think, how do I want to be treated? How do I want to be remembered? Do I want to say I had the gifts and I had the ability and I had the talent and I was too afraid to use it? Sometimes fear to be successful is just as strong as the fear, you know what I mean, of thinking that you can't do it. Mm. I was scared that one, one point I just hit a point, I was like, I'm the best in the world. And it was before I got the gun, and I snapped, and it was like not a cocky, arrogant thing. It was just, I'm the best in the world. I really felt it. And to walk in that is a, it's, it's scary because when you know it, it's like when Bruce Leroy in the movie The Last Dragon got the glow. You know what I mean? You know it. He's like, I got this glow, and I know it. And this, I feel like it's okay. I feel like it's, it's godly to have it and that's when I went on that run I went on that tear and I was you know running through everything that was put up against me and that's the only thing that I that just keep me pushing is that I know that God speaks to me he speaks to a lot of different people and I feel like if we can listen and the quarantine the quarantine was terrible but it's also great because it made us slow down and it made us listen and made us deal with some stuff that we may may have been avoiding and things that we may have just not wanted to deal with and stayed busy to run from it. And now you had to face it. Now you had to deal with it. Everybody should be trying to come out of this quarantine 2.0. We should all be a better version of self. We should all be a little bit more patient. We should all value life a little bit more. Just the, the ability to even be able to see someone, hug that person, Yes. People, people have died during this time and not even got to see you know, their loved one put in the ground. Not even get to say their last goodbyes. And, and we got to really start appreciating each other, appreciating yes. life, um, treating humans like humans, and recognize that why can't we coexist? Why can't we all live together in, in a place where we just say, hey, I like you because you're a good dude. Nothing else. No other check marks need to be checked off. Color, complexion, hair texture, glasses, height. I like you because you're a good dude. Or, yeah. hey, I dig you because you you stand up for this. And that's that's what we got to get to. And if we can do that, you know, I think our economy is going to flourish. I think our leaders are going to become better. I think the household is going to be restored. You know what I mean? It, it just basically everything is can be repaired with love. And yes. sometimes we so effing stubborn we don't want, we don't want to just dish it out you know well, mean? you're stubborn well, with it. well i'll tell you this hopefully you know uh your next fight i want to be able to make that oh mm -hmm. uh, and as you hey they talking uh, about fighting in islands and as so, and as look know. and as you build your coalition i want to help you and all of the work that you're doing in ferguson i want to help you with that and i love the fact that you're utilizing your platform and you're bringing your communities and you're creating win-win scenarios and you've allowed your unique gifts to reach as many people as possible. So just in closing, thank you, Tyron, you know, for being here. Thank you for all that you do for everybody that's, that's watching. Uh, you know, I hope you feel encouraged. I hope you feel inspired. Um, you remember there's a lot of people out there financially struggling due to COVID-19. If you can go to um, uh, givetogethernow.org and contribute, please do you know, hashtag give together now, you know, we've been able to raise a significant amount of money, but we still need to continue to do so. Um, it's really in these conversations right now with uh, Tyron um, Woodley, who's able to um, give us a little nuggets of truth that we need to hear. So I appreciate you voicing your opinion and we are encouraged by you and uh, you the champ, the chosen one. So thank you. I appreciate you, my man. Thank you very much, brother. And yeah, we'll stay in touch. All right, I'll talk to you later.